Hi, it's Mark Bernard here from the Bernard Institute for Cybersecurity, and I'm here uh, today to talk to you about vulnerability management. I want to thank all the people who are following me, and please, uh, by all means, uh, share my videos, and don't forget to hit the like button at the bottom, and, and then go ahead and share them uh, with as many people as you can, okay? I want to try and spread the, the, the knowledge around cybersecurity with everybody. Today we're going to talk about vulnerability management. Now here's some things that maybe you don't know about vulnerability management. If you've been uh, following uh, my series of uh, videos that I've been presenting, I've been uh, uh, publishing uh, around uh, 5 to 20 minute videos uh, on different topics within the cybersecurity program so that uh, I can provide uh, some more knowledge or share some more knowledge about these different topics and uh, and hopefully uh, encourage people to join the cybersecurity profession or if you're already in the profession maybe some of this knowledge will help advance you in your career let's take a look at vulnerability management okay within uh, all known vulnerabilities there's approximately about 60 percent of those that are actually known so some people might say well uh, don't we know about all vulnerabilities well no we don't actually um, I can speak from my experience working on a red team with IBM for a couple of years that uh, actually the 40% that we don't know about is what the hackers like to use in order to exploit uh, technology. The 60% is what's being reported mostly against the uh, what we call the Common Vulnerability and Exposure Database. Now this is a database where manufacturers of hardware and software can report vulnerabilities with their products but it's voluntary. It's not mandatory. This is one of the biggest problems, and we've seen several breaches, including you know, the most recent one, um, where organizations don't report vulnerabilities uh, within their products, or in some cases, they don't know about them. So fair enough, right? But 60% are detected. This means that uh, all the traditional uh, security appliances and software and architecture that we implement in our businesses uh, within government, or within the commercial sector are only about 60% effective. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that. They think I buy um, software, uh, uh, malware detection or anti-malware software or firewalls, that this is going to protect me. Well, unfortunately it won't completely. So uh, that's a bit of a misnomer in the business. Now we know this because uh, we conduct honeypot uh, reports and uh, analysis. And what we do is we basically set up a number of systems with various different configurations and put them out there on the internet. And then we collect intelligence by monitoring it uh, with a monitoring system and, uh, and use that intelligence uh, in order to determine what they can see and what they can't see. And on average, 40% uh, of the types of malware or attacks that we see are not detected by the current uh, brand name uh, anti-malware or uh, intrusion prevention systems or uh, or uh, endpoint protection systems it's just not not happening okay so there are some different techniques that we need to take in order to detect or try and squash the 40 percent that we don't know about let's talk about that a little bit okay so something we call resilience now resilience uh, can be uh, comprises several different activities actually within the vulnerability management program. Now, of course, um, there's a security operation center or a SOC uh, that's used to monitor systems. So if you have an infrastructure and you have a number of devices, uh, servers, firewalls, load balancers, uh, any sort of peripheral devices um, that might uh, have some kind of a logging mechanism, you might want to send those logs to something called a security information and event management system. And in the security information event management system, uh, it gathers and correlates logs. So it looks at like date stamps and time stamps, and then it takes the devices and then it bundles them together and creates a picture on monitors where a number of uh, security analysts are sitting around watching uh, what's going on and watching for spikes. Because of course, there's some pre-programmed uh, intelligence into these systems that comes with the packages uh, that will allow you to report on, again, known vulnerabilities or known threats. However, you can also customize most of these packages too based on the industry that you work on. We know that the critical infrastructure is made up of 16 different industries and each of those industries have a particular uh, unique mission or unique product or service that they're providing. 
And that means that you need the flexibility of your security information event management system in order to be able to pull logs from the various devices that are within your infrastructure and report on them or monitor, monitor uh, them for any sort of events or anomalies. And, and you can imagine that the devices within a, a typical commercial enterprise, you know, you have uh, firewalls, load balancers, servers, maybe intrusion pre prevention or host uh, uh, prevention. You have a number of different systems that could report logs. Uh, that might vary quite a bit from uh, a health authority, for instance, where you have microbiology uh, systems uh, such as, uh, you know, uh, life monitoring systems, defibrillators, uh, lots of different types of systems that the clinicians use in order to monitor the health of, uh, and status. And uh, those also create logs that can be monitored on a security uh, operation center. As well in the industry, uh, the energy industry, they have control systems. A lot of these control systems have been built behind uh, firewalls. Uh, they've never been connected to the Internet in the past until in the last five or 10 years. Uh, now they, uh, per, they generate logs and they can also be monitored through a security operation center. And uh, other systems like banking systems, um, manufacturing systems, uh, pharmaceutical systems where you have laboratories and you have doctors on the lab floor building new products like um, vaccines for antivirus, okay? They use systems that create logs that can also be hacked if they're plugged into the internet. And they also create logs that can be monitored through a security operations center. So security operations uh, and monitoring is one of the most fundamental things that you need to be able to do, correlating all the information around your infrastructure, around your various facilities, whether they're warehousing, head offices, laboratories, um, even the supply chain to some degree. Okay, in order to give you uh, completely uh, a good perspective of what's going on in the cybersecurity world within your environment, within your business. So this is a very important thing. I can't underscore how uh, important it is to do uh, SOC or monitoring of anomalies and events. Now, threat hunting is another uh, technique or a process that we go through in order to attack that 40% that we don't know about. So uh, we go into the system, we evaluate software, we evaluate configurations, we look for any type of anomalies that we see, and we investigate them. We hunt them down, and we try to determine what is the cause for any sort of anomaly or, or uh, a variation within our infrastructure. So we, you can imagine, in order to be able to do this type of monitoring, you need a very stable environment. So uh, other practices such as uh, change management, and problem management and incident management. These are other procedures that we're not talking about today, but they're related. And uh, you need to be able to do these uh, very effectively. You need to be able to test systems and implement them into your environment after they've been reviewed and certified, or perhaps uh, there's been some uh, user acceptance testing uh, that might include um, um, different types of tests, for instance, uh, in order to see uh, what kind of stresses the application or the hardware goes through in order to make sure that it meets the requirements of the network. So a lot of threat hunting can go on uh, through the team. Security analysts, again, are usually doing this within the SOC. Patch management, very important. Uh, we've heard now several incidents uh, where uh, organizations have been hacked uh, because uh, there's a vulnerability in the software and it wasn't patched properly. We heard about Equifax. It cost $760 million the last time I heard in order to fix that problem. And now we have a much bigger problem uh, in the U.S. with the government with uh, solar winds. Apparently they had a vulnerability and they may not have known about this. So this might be classified as a zero day threat. And a zero day threat is uh, something that's very uh, special and dangerous as well. And that's where you have a vulnerability within a system, but the manufacturer is not aware of it. So that is unfortunate. And then you have a vulnerability management scanning. So this is a little bit different than monitoring. So monitoring on the SOC is in real time, it's live. Uh, using intrusion prevention systems is in real time, it's live. It's sitting on the wire, as we like to say, and it's monitoring the packets, doing deep packet inspection in order to determine if there's any threats. And of course, the internet is going dark. And uh, what we mean by that is that more and more people are encrypting their traffic on the internet. And that also means uh, that the bad guys are also encrypting their traffic. And a lot of the traditional systems that used to be able to detect the 60% of the vulnerabilities can no longer do that because some of the packets are encrypted. In most businesses, especially in the commercial sector, 
uh, if a packet, if, if it's encrypted, uh, they usually pass it directly into the environment. They don't hold it and then interrogate it or inspect it further. However, that would be the, the best approach, of course, is to be able to look at everything. So being able to decrypt and encrypt the traffic on the network is very important. Now, yet I digress, so let's get back to vulnerability management. So there are vulnerability management scanning tools, but they look at the 60%. So you run these tools. Uh, one tool I'm thinking of is Nessus. Uh, Megasploit kind of does the same thing. Uh, they look at the 60% of known threats that are registered in the MITRE Common Vulnerability Exposure Database. And, uh, and then they scan the environment to see if any of those vulnerabilities exist. So this is more of a maintenance exercise just to make sure that the patching is kept up to date. Then there's red teaming. And as I mentioned before, I was on a red team for two years. Now red teaming, what we do, uh, most of us are uh, systems engineers, network engineers, and software engineers. And what we do is uh, we are experts on the different types of operating systems, different types of software, and uh, different types of uh, programming languages and network uh, protocols. And what we do is we manipulate uh, that type of information in order to bypass uh, security controls. At least we try to. Uh, red teaming is usually conducted from um, one sister company against another sister company. So in the case of uh, the, the uh, red teaming that I was doing, it was uh, you know IBM Canada doing it against IBM US and IBM US would do it against IBM Canada. This is pretty common practice in large organizations. As you can probably imagine, IBM has been around for many, many decades and they're very good at security. Uh, so this is something that they take very seriously and they do a very good job at it. So red teaming is when you have a bunch of experts sitting around and we don't look at the common vulnerability database because we don't really care about that. What we look at is the 40% uh, that we can get by uh, get into the environment, not be detected, and maybe leave a, a message for the system administrator to let them know that we were there. Um, it's never malicious. Uh, we work for the company, and red teaming is an important security test uh, that most organizations should do. And if they don't do, um, they should consider it, reconsider it. Heuristic analysis. Now, what this means is that, again, we have a stable environment, a networking environment, and uh, so we have all our systems patched, uh, changes coming into the environment are tested before they're deployed. Okay, so we have a very stable environment. And, and now what we do is we have a baseline of the type of traffic that we see normally on the network. Um, initially, when you implement an IPS system, what you do is uh, you'll take a three month snapshot usually. And, uh, and it'll, you'll run it over uh, some very heavy processing periods, such as maybe year end when you do a lot of financial record processing. Uh, within the general ledger, or maybe it's end of month uh, when you have uh, a heavy uh, processing load for manufacturing uh, and uh, and the deployment or the uh, I guess the um, um, movement of uh, data within your environment. So you want to overlap that uh, that baseline over those different periods so that you can turn on the heuristic analysis. And what heuristic analysis does is it monitors that 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 path or that, uh, sorry, that benchmark. And when it sees, uh, when it sees the benchmark uh, and it monitors it for a period of time, it gets smarter and smarter about it. So what it does is it, when it detects little bumps or anything unusual that's going on on the uh, network, it'll report it. And uh, so heuristic analysis is an important part of monitoring, of trying to automate or orchestrate uh, the cybersecurity uh, process and, and improve on resilience. And then, of course, there's internal audit. So internal audit can never be um, devalued in any way. It's very important. It's a quality management uh, uh, process that provides assurance to the organization. Now, internal auditors are different than external auditors. So internal auditors generally uh, play the role of an enterprise architect, if you like. Uh, they understand the business. They understand all the different business functions uh, within the organization. So they become the experts on the organization and they can often tell you uh, what's going to work and what's not going to work and where the systems are that are a little bit uh, weak or vulnerable and, uh, and the types of activities that need to go on. So they're, they are your in-house experts. External auditors are a little bit different because they can't rely on uh, the information of the employees in any way. They have to do their own independent assessment. Both teams uh, provide a level of assurance the internal audit, of course, is more flexible uh, because they work with the company and they know more about the company on a day-to-day -day basis. 
the external auditor comes in at a point in time and they take a point in time snapshot of the organization without knowing everything about what's going on. So they're very different. So vulnerability management is uh, very detailed. It's not just a matter of making of patching vulnerabilities. There's a lot of things that we need to do to improve the resilience of our organizations. So I hope you found this information useful. Um, remember, uh, I have, you can reach me on uh, any social media. I have, uh, I'm on LinkedIn and I have a company website on LinkedIn. I'm also, uh, I also have a company website on Facebook, uh, YouTube I'm publishing on, Vimeo I'm publishing on, and also uh, Twitter uh, coming soon. And if you want to uh, sign up or take some training at our, our, at our organization, you can come to the website at bernard-institute.com or you can reach out and email me or call me. Uh, I'd love to hear from you. I want to thank everybody for following me and I hope you found this useful. And remember to uh, like the video if you found it useful and please share it with your friends. Thanks for now.